let's reduce emissions. Let's aim for 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade, ideally 1.5, but let's plan for four. Let's plan our infrastructure for the regional impacts of a global change of about four degrees. So that's the direction that we're broadly pointing in. Because you're going to have to think, well, what the costs of putting infrastructure in for four degrees centigrade is far more expensive than putting it in for two degrees centigrade. But if you put it in for two degrees centigrade, then you get hit by four, then you've maladapted the future. And that's also very important for some of the countries that are developing their city infrastructures now to not follow examples of the West. Put the infrastructure in that is suitable for a very, very different climate from the one you've got today. In this Climate Gen episode, we are discussing the risks of maladaptation that can seriously undermine our efforts to tackle the climate challenges we know are coming towards us. Dr. Lisa Shipper is an Environmental Social Science Research Fellow at the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford, whose work focuses on adaptation to climate change in developing countries, looking at factors that include gender, religion and culture to understand what drives vulnerability. As vulnerability and suffering increase, it is critical we are able to engage as many people as possible to help shape the solutions that benefit us all and avoid critical errors that can have long-lasting detrimental effects. In the next episode, I'm speaking with Kelly Vanser from the Silver Lining Institute in Washington about their work in trying to counter near-term Earth system destabilization by a combination of advanced supercomputer simulations and interventions that might include marine cloud brightening. Thanks for listening to Climate Gen. You can support this work and get episodes earlier by becoming a Patreon backer. And you can also subscribe for free on YouTube and all major podcast channels. Lisa, it's fabulous to speak to you. Thank you very much. We hear a lot of talk at the moment about the need to adapt, certainly someone who says it myself, but can you give us a definition of maladaptation in the context of a real world example? Yeah, maladaptation is basically bad adaptation, but it's not just adaptation that doesn't work. It's actually adaptation that backfires so that it makes people worse off and more vulnerable to climate change. But even if you kind of want the fuller definition, you'd even say that maladaptation undermines the opportunity to adapt in the future. So it really is the wrong track and and kind of going on the wrong pathway. And I think some of the, the, the most striking examples of maladaptation are around coastal defenses and sort of the infrastructure that's set up to protect coastal areas from uh, coastal erosion, from, from storm surges, from other kinds of sea level rise. Because these things tend to be very costly. They tend, they're really costly to plan and then to implement, and of course, build. And then once you have them, if you've got it wrong, you're actually not likely to, to take them away, especially things built out of concrete. It's, it's unlikely that they're going to be just you know, removed once people realize what's going wrong. But the way that they can impact people adversely is essentially that they can lock in a certain attitude about risk so that you can end up making people moving to places where they actually shouldn't be living, even with the coastal defense. So they're actually more exposed to hazards. But it also can, can lead to creating new problems. So we had this example that I talked a lot about, about in Fiji, where, where there was a wall built to protect from sea surge and sea level rise. And in fact, what happened is that the wall prevents they didn't think that when it rains the wall water has to drain somewhere so it actually locks in the water when it rains into into the the settlement and so it creates new problems it creates floods so these are the kinds of things unfortunately that we see more and more now yeah there are a lot of obviously countries and regions who are vulnerable to the climate change and are already adapting to these experiences that they're getting in in real time now. Is there a risk in terms of maladaptation that we sort of start adapting to say two degrees when there's a potential for going over two degrees? So the impacts overwhelm what we're, is that another form of maladaptation? Yes, that kind of adaptation, when we start sort of looking at the wrong temperature could potentially be be a maladaptation if it ends up making us do things or make choices that will then undermine our ability to adapt in a warmer temperature or will make us more vulnerable to that temperature. Essentially, one of the reasons why we don't think that way in adaptation is that it's only until recently that we realize that there's a temperature limit to our ability to adapt as well. And that's partly because science hasn't really connected 
with the greenhouse gas, the warming, global warming levels with adaptation capacity or adaptation potential to adapt. Uh, it's really only when the IPCC's special report on 1.5 degrees came out that scientists scrambled to try to put together what we understand about sort of where the limits to adaptation are in terms of global warming levels. So the, I would say the knowledge on this is a little bit sketchy. We don't really know that much about if it's going to be this warm, we need to do this, 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 this. But if it's going to be this warm, we also need to do this, this, this. We can guess, but we don't know for a fact because we don't know exactly how things are going to change. The other thing I should say is that if we start sort of aiming for four degrees every time, it's going to be really costly because we're probably going to be aiming for things that are enormous transformations that will just be hugely challenging politically, physically, socially, and so on. So I just, I think that's a really challenging kind of problem. But of course, it could be that we end up deciding, oh, we're going to think that it's only 1.5 degrees. And then we know, well, these are the kinds of things to expect. And then it gets warmer and we're not prepared at all. And we invested lots of money and people have changed their jobs or something, you know, so it could really go wrong. Yes. Well, it seems like a really interesting dilemma that it seems like we're, we're overshooting. If you look at the emissions are still going up and impacts are with us. We're in this sort of era of consequences now and we're starting to get a taste for it. But we're not actually putting the brakes on the emissions. So what do we adapt to? And the reason I said that was because one of the previous interviewees said we should aim for adaptation for four degrees, but try and stick to two, you know, be prepared for the worst and hope for the best kind of thing. It seems like we're somewhere in, in this mess where we don't quite know where we're going and we don't know what the threshold of our adaptability is. Is, is that fair? Yeah, I think part of the reason is that we have to remember climate change is not just kind of coming into the world in isolation. We have lots of other issues, and particularly in many, many countries around the world, there are such huge development gaps, so much poverty, so much inequality. And it's as a consequence of that, that, that when we then have climate change, it it really exacerbates these problems. But these are things that are happening somewhat independently of, of the impacts of climate change, right? So we can't foresee exactly how those things are going to change over time as well. So while the climate is changing and temperature increases, what I think are the biggest question marks are the sort of social changes, the social dimensions, and that whole kind of the societal shift. And I think that the idea that we had until 2030 to, to, to take action on 1.5, which was sort of this confused message that came out of the IPCC report release in 2018, suggesting that, in fact, we don't have to do anything until 2030, which is, of course, totally wrong. That wasn't what it was meant, but it was the way it was interpreted. And I think it sends a message that, you know, it's all going to be fine. And then there'll be some sort of tipping point and the climate change is so much that, you know, it's too hot, it's too cold. But actually, I think Miles Allen pointed out that before we even get to that point where the climate has changed so much, we're going to be facing probably these massive changes in society. We're probably going to see a lot more tensions, a lot more conflicts. And I think, you know, you could already see these kinds of things happening around questions about sort of how we take action on climate and environment. For instance, what's happening right now in Sri Lanka, which is, you know, an example of an attempt to, to limit chemical fertilizers and to prevent pollution in Sri Lanka. But at the same time, it's backfiring so badly that, you know, the yields are really low and farmers are really unhappy and the rice farmers have been a really important support to the current prime minister. He may not be there anymore, but he's teetering on, on taking off. And I think that these are the kind of examples that you might not necessarily directly connect with climate change. But if you understand that it's through this kind of policy environment and through these kinds of efforts that we're actually we're creating these tensions that then inter act with, in the case of Sri Lanka, obviously underlying religious political tensions that have been there for a long time. And you have that all around the world. Well, I'll put it in a more local context. Europe now is gripped by this heat wave and there's crippling drought in Italy. There's fires in Portugal, there's crop failures, there's people dying, etc. Are we becoming a sort of graphic example of not adapting in some respects? Maladaptation, I don't know if we've got that far even, but are we risking maladaptation by 
by almost always being reactive to a point where the problems are getting bigger and bigger and there comes a point where that threshold for adaptability is lowered because we haven't done it when we when we could have done I think the answer is yes, but I think that the reason is that when we talk about maladaptation, normally the reason we have maladaptation is because of poor planning. And poor planning is defined by not looking at sort of the context of the people who are supposed to be adapting. So typically not really understanding the vulnerability drivers. Those kinds of things exist everywhere. They exist in Europe as well. You see them in the form of political clashes primarily and the emergence of fascism and so on. And I think that we have to keep in mind that when we are reacting, we often don't have the time to really take into consideration all the different perspectives and all the different political Political standpoints, and that is therefore likely to not be a very sustainable solution. And in the case of maladaptation, that's just reactive. Again, it can be the same. And particularly, I think what's important to keep in mind is this concept of climate justice, where we need to keep everybody sort of. We're we're talking about keeping building resilience of everybody and not just a a couple of people. And so when you react quickly to try to help people in the case of an extreme event, it's very hard to get everybody included in such a plan or in such an effort. So I think that this is these are the ways in which maladaptation can, can happen. And certainly, again, I just want to underscore that when you make certain decisions quickly based on the emergency situation, there's always the risk that you undermine opportunities for future, more sustainable, more inclusive adaptation. And so, again, that's, for me, one of the main reasons why we need to be really cautious of maladaptation. A recent paper that you've been involved with or you've commented on identifies four structural challenges that need to be overcome in adaptation implementation. Can you just give us an idea of what those are? Yeah, absolutely. So this study identified that essentially there are four recurring themes that seem to emerge when and that seem to be causes of maladaptation. And this is based on previous studies, but it basically confirms what a lot of other people have found. And and the first one is that there's just an emphasis on technological fixes. And technological fixes, I would also put infrastructure in there as a kind of anything that is just seen as like, you don't really have to consult with people, you don't really have to involve people, you just you know, produce something that that solves the problem. But obviously, the lack of flexibility in a lot of these solutions is basically against resilience in some ways. So it really isn't going to be a sustainable way to face the constantly changing climate. The other problem that we see over and over again is that there's a big kind of what we've seen over the, the course of the last few years is that as climate change has grown up the policy agenda, there's also been this big debate about should the climate finance that comes from the global north to the global south, should that money be separate from the other development money? So adaptation and mitigation funding uh, should not be just taken from the other development money and then said, oh, here it's, it's, this, it's a different money, has a different label on it. But in fact, there should be a separation, it should be very clear. So what's happened is that in all these development projects, there's been this additional request every time for projects to separate clearly why, what's adaptation and what's development in the project. But this means essentially that the projects don't, on adaptation, don't really reflect all the development dimensions because they're sort of trying to keep away from them. And often then, you know, ultimately the kind of the the bigger picture of what's driving vulnerability to climate change and therefore what causes climate change risk isn't considered sufficiently. So it really forces people to look at a very narrow picture of the problem and therefore that can also lead to maladaptation. And then we have this other very typical that we see all over in development practice as well, this problem where this is often public money, there needs to be some kind of accountability. And what we do through, therefore, the development actors want to create some kind of sense of what, you know, are we succeeding in what we're doing here with these projects? And they do that through quantitative metrics. They have a way of saying, okay, you know, well, we've carried out 15 workshops on resilience. Tick. And these are the kinds of things that ultimately the only way that they are able to judge whether they've been successful in the project, even though that's actually all about project management more than about the actual 
project kind of outcome, the substantive outcome of the project. But these things, they come up over and over again, and they stand in the way and they create confusions and they force projects that essentially were maybe conceptualized in one place in a very sophisticated way with a good understanding of the difference between adaptation development or the linkages between them. When they then travel down to the ground and have to be implemented, there's this reductionist process that ends up making them, kind of forcing them to only look at certain dimensions. And that leaves huge gaps in terms of what's being examined. And often, therefore, we, we don't really learn lessons about what we've done wrong because we're only tracking certain kinds of things. So that's how maladaptation can emerge. And then finally, it is sort of similar but we talked a little bit about earlier is adaptation. It's part of a bigger process of adjusting society to all of the different pressures that are happening simultaneously. But when you sort of integrate mainstream, it's called mainstreaming adaptation into all sorts of development planning, it loses kind of its importance and other kinds of issues take priority. And it isn't always clear to the decision makers that actually adaptation of climate change is very much connected to these other actions. And so, you know, like food security, there may not necessarily be this immediate link that food security and adaptation of climate change, maybe they're looking at it from a security perspective now with the war in Ukraine, thinking food security from that perspective. And that doesn't, yeah, it's simply they don't make that connection to climate change. And the food security issue is, is a priority because we have this war that has just kind of fallen, fallen into our laps. So those are the, the kinds of things that seem to be definitely over and over again contributing to maladaptation. Okay. And you were talking there about how we integrate these into development plans and things. And one problem we seem to have at the moment is, and I'll cite the UK as a good example, a complete sort of ineptitude at the leadership level. And what I'm very curious about, and also in other parts of Europe, you know, no doubt, how important is it that this research and this, this knowledge that you're creating about how we do these practices permeates out of academia um, and more into the mainstream. So yeah, sure, we've got to give it to the policymakers because they've got to try and do something right, but also people. I mean, I think it need, it's almost like we, we need to be more on the ball with some of this stuff and calling for it. I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think you could definitely identify, for example, all the way from kind of the individual or local level, the our responsibility in sort of contributing to ensuring that we don't see maladaptation happening. And, you know, at the end, it is the politicians who make these big decisions um, and the private sector play a big role as well, especially in the infrastructural kinds of adjustments. But I think, you know, on a local level, you can see in countries where there's opportunity for sort of participation and democratic discussion that that people can actually be engaged in uh, opportunities to understand what's changing in their landscape. And for instance, you know, what kind of coastal protection is going to be put up in a place? You know, if there's an if there's an open meeting, people can go, should go and listen and then also maybe say, hang on, but is there any risk of maladaptation here, you know, and because if, if they understand this concept, then they can help bring that to the developers, for instance. So I think that the main kind of thing that an individual can do is just to have that knowledge. So certainly having, you know, sharing it. But I do worry that if we keep talking about maladaptation, that people are also going to start thinking that adaptation is always going to fail. And it isn't really something that we can rely on and that they will you know continuously question projects i mean i think it's important to be critical and to you know keep a critical mind and kind of you know question but i don't think that we should be constantly worried that we can't trust decisions being made and that we're not safe there's such a need for adaptation that that train is coming down the track anyway but it's also the risk of maladaptation might be by misappropriation of funds, being able to spot these things or put safeguards on to make sure opportunists don't get in there and do something cheap when they, you know, these kinds of issues are what where we're really looking at in terms of safeguarding um, the outcomes, if you like. Yeah, and actually I spoke to one um, MP in the UK who was asking, well, you know, 
what about if we just put funds together so that we could go in and clean up all these maladaptation messes afterwards? The, then there's a f- sort of fundamental misunderstanding of what maladaptation is. I mean, it's not just adaptation gone wrong. It's actually adaptation that makes people so, you know, so much worse off that it may not be possible to adapt. And so that's why I keep repeating that because I think it's important to, to recognize we talk a lot about the impacts of climate change and the irreversibility of a lot of these impacts, especially at warmer global warming temperatures. We're really, so that's what we're looking at is things losing ecosystems and also um, habitats for people and animals that will just we can't be there any longer. And it doesn't matter what we do. We're not going to, to get those back, even if the temperature comes down. And I think these are the things that, that we need to understand in terms of climate change is that when we try to adapt to something, Meanwhile, the climate is also changing. So it's, you know, after two years of make, trying to adapt, um, things have changed. We can't, you know, go back to where we were before um, and start over and say, oh, 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 okay, scratch that. Let's, let's go again. Not just because of the funding, but also because it might mean that, you know, you've lost these opportunities. It made people worse off, but also the trust, I think, is a huge part of it. Is, you know, what, why would people trust you to come in and do another project when you've already failed? Yeah. Okay. Just really to end on, but if you if you did have advice to policymakers, what would it be on this topic? Well, first of all, to really understand it and to understand what maladaptation, what kind of consequences there are, and there are, especially in the IPCC Working Group Two report, there's a, a number of examples listed, and there are also other papers that now are really showing kind of what kind of problems there are. And it's not just infrastructure, I should emphasize, because I think that they're the easy one because it's easy to spot. So it's physically you can actually you can take photos and you can you can sort of have it in your mind. But I mean, there are other ways that maladaptation happens through power dynamics, through preventing certain groups from being able to access or participate in projects. That's one. And also where money comes in and it only goes to the sort of the elites, the local elites to then decide how they're going to use the money. And if they're the elites, they're probably not the most vulnerable. And this again is where the climate justice dimension comes in as sort of the, the ones who are the most exposed, the ones who are the most sensitive, therefore the most vulnerable. They're often also the ones who don't have access to these decision-making spaces and who are maybe don't even have voting power, maybe they have no say at all. And so consequently, we can very easily reproduce projects that are only dealing with a local elite because we don't even realize that the money doesn't actually trickle to everybody. Um, so it's important to just to recognize that the many ways in which maladaptation can happen, and it's a risk and a waste of money, of course, but also potentially really makes a huge problem for thinking about future adaptation opportunities. Okay. Well, I think that's a good place to, to end. This sort of idea that climate justice and putting that very close to the, the core actually links it to a more resilient society. So, yeah. well, look, thank you very much. It's been great to speak to you. Thank you. Thanks again for listening. If you are interested to help support this series and help expand the discussion around climate topics, then please do consider backing my channel via Patreon. It will help me produce more content and you will also gain access to more expert interviews. It would be great to engage more with audiences too and understand your views on these topics.